Welcome everyone to, um, let me just put on the speaker view. Yeah. If you would mind muting yourselves, that's great. Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone to another uh, Radiant Torah, uh, the Parsha class based on the teachings of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov and other tzaddikim. And today we are learning Parshas Bahaloscha. And this Parsha is very jam-packed. We are not going to be able to get to everything in the Parsha, but we will certainly cover some hot topics. Okay. And uh, I want to thank the sponsor of this class, um, Dr. Eleonora Gaudis, for continuing to support and share breast love Torah learning for women. Okay. So we begin. Vayidaber Hashem El Moshe Lemur. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Deber El Aaron, Amarta Elav, Bahaloscha Es Haneros, Elmu Pene Hamenora, Yairu Shivas Haneros. So Hashem spoke to Moshe, telling him to speak to Aaron, his brother, and say to him, when you light the lamps towards the face of the menorah, shall the seven lamps be lit. So what's going on here? What is the Parsha beginning with? It's beginning with the menorah. The menorah appears many times, certainly in, in Shamos. And what we're going to do today is take a quick look at the menorah before we continue on to other parts of the Parsha. The reason I'm not doing a Parsha summary today is because there are just too many things. And if I summarize it, that itself will take half an hour. So just bear with me. We, we're, we left Har Sinai. We're wandering in the desert. We're wandering in the Midbar. And we're starting with the menorah. So um, why is this important in terms of the topics that I said we're going to be talking about today? I said we're going to talk about anti-Semitism, we're going to talk about the era of Rav, and so on and so forth. So what we have to understand is that everything that happens in the world is a message to us. And this is an important theme in this particular Parsha. And the menorah is a specific message to us telling us we need to go up. Bahaloscha actually implies not just illuminate, but to go up, to raise up. And Rabbi Nachman teaches us, very interestingly, that we each walk around with a menorah on our faces, on our heads. Now, one of the things that we have to be clear on is that the menorah, the Hanukkah that we light, okay, the Hanukkah that we light, the menorah, is a different than the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash. That menorah had three branches on either side and one in the middle. It was a seven-branched menorah, okay? And when Rebbe Nachman is speaking about the menorah on our faces and what this has to do with us responding to the world and responding to Hashem, he's speaking about the seven branch menorah. And he speaks about the seven lamps in our heads. What are these seven lamps? They are the two eyes, the two ears, the two nostrils, and the one mouth, okay? can add it up. It's seven. So because of Rashi's explanation that Bahaloscha actually means to raise up, Rebbe Nachman teaches us, and this is a, a famous teaching from Lakute Moharan Lesson 21. If anybody's interested in learning that lesson, it's spectacular, that when we have a flame in our heart, when our heart is ignited with love for Hashem, love for the Jewish people, love for the Torah, it illuminates our face with a holy light. Okay, each of us, every single one of us. So how do we 
illuminate ourselves? How do we make our hearts on fire for Hashem? We have to sanctify the seven lamps. So just as the lamps were cleaned and prepared and, and polished and so on in the menorah, we have to do the same to the lamps in our head. So Rabbi Nachman explains that the way in which we sanctify all the openings of our head, the first is with the eyes, is what we look at, what we take in, what is getting past our eyes and going to our brains and our hearts. We want to be clear that what we're taking in is uplifting, positive, true, okay, doesn't contain things that are going to bring us down or push us away from Hashem. We want to look at beautiful sights and beauty for a Jew isn't just a physical external thing, it's a spiritual thing. So that's what we want to look at. We also can say with the eyes that how we look, how we project our vision outward also is a measure of sanctifying meaning. Do we look at each other with love or do we look at each other critically? Okay, so what we take in and what we send out, okay? Next, how do we sanctify our ears? And, and by the way, I'm really summarizing this. There's so much more to say about it. Um, but again, if you want more, you can always uh, learn more in Likute Maharan. Okay, so the way we sanctify our ears, again, is by hearing truth, um, listening to music that comes from a good source, a positive source. Um, telling stories about the tzaddikim and listening to them, okay? Because this actually inspires us and helps us sanctify um, our ears. The, the Rebbe says specifically, by having a muna in the tzaddikim, that's how we sanctify our ears, okay? So when we have that level of a muna in the tzaddikim, it sanctifies our ears. How do we develop that amuna? Like I mentioned before, telling stories about the tzaddikim, learning about them, talking about them. Okay, a lot of people do this on Shabbos, on Shabbat. Some people do it at uh, the third meal, Shalashid. Some people do it at the um, at, at, at the Malava Malka after Shabbat. It's a very beautiful thing. If you don't have a collection of stories of the tzaddikim, go get one. Go get one and, and share these stories and learn about them. It will keep you inspired and keep your amuna in the tzaddikim, which is as important as your amuna in Hashem. You have to have both. After all, this Parsha, the first thing that Hashem does is he speaks to Moshe, okay? So Moshe is the archetypal tzaddik. So we wanna reinforce that faith in the tzaddikim. Okay, next, we did eyes, we did ears. How about our nostrils? Okay. So the Rebbe says, by breathing in Yeras Hashem, what is Yeras Hashem? It's an awe of Hashem. It's this consciousness of Hashem's greatness, commonly translated as fear, okay? Um, also, another thing we can do to sanctify the candles on our face of the nostrils is to not get angry, okay? Why? So there's a beautiful lesson on this. One day we'll explore it in another class. But the idea is, is to take a deep breath in, count to 10. Everybody knows that expression, count to 10. How many of us really actually do it? Okay. Count to 10, don't get angry. Patience being the, is linked with the ability to breathe. And that ability to breathe and the patience of, very important to sanctifying our nostrils, our noses, that aspect of the menorah of our face. Okay, um, let's see, let's see. What else am I missing? The mouth, which is, of course, it's only one, but boy, is there a lot about the mouth, but we'll keep it short. So the first thing is obviously Lashon Hara, okay? Speaking bad about another Jew. We should avoid this. We should look always for the Jews in the Kuda Tova, as big as the challenge as it is. We should always look for their good point. And we should speak good about each other. What does speaking good about each other and to each other mean? What does that mean, really? So it means that if you're going to actually address something about another person, choose a positive thing, choose a strength, 
Every parent knows this. Every parent has been schooled for the past two decades to when they see their child doing something they don't like, not to say that's bad, but to redirect their child towards something good. When the child makes a drawing that looks like a scribble, you don't say, well, that's a scribble. What you say is, is, oh, I'm trying to see something in here. What do you see? This is how we have to speak to each other. Adults, okay? This is genuine truth. It's a genuine way to sanctify ourselves. Rebbe Nachman cautions us greatly about giving Musr to another person, ethically or morally correcting another person, okay? He says that most people do not know how to do this usually what happens is they stir up so much bitterness and the other person, he says that the other person gives off a stink. What does that mean? You know, a bad smell. You're stirring up so many negative feelings when you correct another person. Okay. So we want to be very cautious about that. If it's at all possible to avoid correcting someone, avoid it. You'll sanctify your mouth. Um, also important, there's so much more, but I'm not going to, you know, I don't really want to belabor the menorah aspect, but there's so much more on, for example, not mocking anything holy or religious. So people tend to think, we all do, we all think that our particular point of view is plain vanilla or it's the right space to be in. This is how we believe is the truth. And we have to believe that because we each have to connect with the tzaddikim and a particular tzaddik, whoever that may be. And we have to really follow their guidance. So what you follow may not be exactly what I follow, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be respected. Okay. As long as it's connected to Torah, as long as it's true to Torah. Okay. So mockery, like Sanus is a way to immediately bring impurity to, to the mouth. And so people think if someone is more religious than, than what I think is appropriate, okay, they're too strict, they're too this, how do you know that's not right for them? How do you know that that path isn't working for them? We really don't know. The opposite is also true, okay? Just because someone's to the right of you doesn't mean they're a fanatic. Someone's to the left of you doesn't mean they're a bum. It doesn't. And we want to be careful with our mouths to reflect that, that by being respectful of all Torah tree paths. Easier said than done. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is to very important to not speak falsehood. This includes um, lies. It includes flattery. It includes trying to con control an outcome through verbal manipulation. Okay, so many different levels of this. We want to speak the truth to the best of our ability. Okay, and we'll sanctify our mouth. So when we go to raise up this flame from our heart that I spoke about, we have to understand it works in both directions, coming from the lamps by sanctifying them. We then inspire ourselves and stir up our heart and by also working on inspiring ourselves, okay? That also helps us sanctify because it gives us reasons to sanctify. When we inspire ourselves, we learn, we have self-reflection, maybe we make his bodhidus, we make his bodhidu, we talk to Hashem about how we want to come closer to him. And all of this is going to give us the zest to move forward. Now, Rabbi Nachman has a very amazing teaching. He says that everybody, every Jew is connected in a chain and there's, or a ladder and there's one rung per person. Okay. This is a very novel view of the Jewish people. There are other views also very useful to understanding who we are. But in this view, the Rebbe says, when we go up a level, a spiritual level, we bump up the person who was standing on that level that we were previous, that we're on now, the previous person who was there. And we sort of pull up the person who is on the level beneath us, so to speak, because we've made room for him and we're all attached and we yank him up. 
This is how one little mitzvah that a person does can literally affect every Jew in the world. Keep that vision in mind. So when you're sanctifying yourself, whatever you do, you refrain. You just refrain from criticizing someone once. You just refrain one time. You've made a literal chain reaction. That is an aspect of achdut, unity, okay, that people have to really be aware of in order to live. We all know that with Octus, with unity, okay, we have people getting together in groups. We have these wonderful, um, whether they're Farbrangans, whatever they are, this is all good. We have people of a single accord, people standing together. Right now, people coming together to fight anti-Semitism in various ways. Don't knock the person who's coming together by improving themselves. That person isn't necessarily selfish at all. Someone who's taking on extra prayers, someone who's working on their mitos, their personality traits and characteristics is as important as someone going to speak to the United President of the United States and talking about anti-Semitism. As important. Maybe even more important, we don't know because we really don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Okay. If you uh, normally, I would um, not take a question now, but if you don't understand this, I want this concept to be very clear because what I'm doing by discussing this is I'm answering several questions that I got this week. And, and this is my answer to the question of, well, what should I be doing about the rise in anti-Semitism and the Jew bashing and the Israel bashing? And um, what, you know, and you know, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? And what do I make of people who aren't doing what I'm doing? Are they not being supportive? This is my answer. It's not just my answer, obviously. Okay, it's really not my answer. It's the answer of the tzaddikim is to understand we each have various ways to express and improve our togetherness and the state of the Jewish people as a whole. If you don't understand this, you can jump in and ask a question. I guess it must be clear. I have a question. Yes. Okay. So whoever just said you have a question, that your sound stopped. You must have muted yourself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Question. Um, is it from me or someone else? I don't know what you mean. Who has a question? I can't me, Charlene. Charlene. Charlene, what's your question? My, My question, question is, is, is that, that so, so you're saying that you can work on yourself and you can improve your relationship with Hashem, and that is helping the Jewish people. Yes, absolutely. Also, you could promote Afdus by by looking at the good in another Jew. Yes. And that could be your effort. I'm just trying to summarize it a little bit. Yes. So the idea is, is when you improve yourself, whenever we, for example, we gave all the points of, the, we gave, didn't give all of them, we gave some of the points of the seven lamps of the face. When you work on yourself, you improve your connection to Hashem. You pray more, you do more mitzvahs, you give more tzedakah, you, you just work on yourself internally. You are actually contributing to the Jewish people as a whole based on Rebbe Nachman's description of this chain and this ladder and based on other descriptions as well. For example, the Chabad Rebbeim have the description, they're very specific about this description. I think it was the uh, Balatanya who said this originally of the Jewish people as um, one body. Okay, in, in their description, somebody's the head, somebody's the elbow, somebody's the foot. In this description, we're constantly in a state, in Rebbe Nachman's description, we're constantly in a state of flux because we're constantly growing. Okay, now, are there other things that people can do? Yeah, but that's not the subject of this class. Specifically, I want to make sure that it's clear that not everybody has to play the same exact role. As a matter of fact, Definitely, we don't have to play the same exact role. 
in helping the Jewish people as a whole. Okay. So we want to understand this. Okay. So I'm assuming that everybody understands. If not, what we'll do is we'll get back to this question later at the end of class. Okay. Thank you, Sherlyn. All right. So that is the menorah and the Kutai Maharan lesson 21. Now, um, so now I want to go to us wandering in the midbar. Okay, hold on one second. Let me find my notes. Um, so here we are. After we get it, learn about the menorah, we understand that we're wandering in the midbar. Okay, and the Torah tells us that the, the it describes how we wandered. It speaks about the Anane, Hakavo, the clouds of glory, and how they led us and how they would lift up when it was time to travel. And one of the keys about our wanderings is, is that we did not know, okay, how long we would be staying at each spot. So I may have mentioned it in the previous class when we did Bamidbar. We didn't have class last week for Parshas Naso. But this idea, we didn't know. We were always on our toes. We always had to be prepared to follow Hashem's command. Sometimes we'd be at a spot for a day. We just unpack our tents. Can you imagine? I mean, these we're talking millions of people mothers and babies and infants and diapers and bottles and elderly people. And I mean, just the stuff of life. It's not like it wasn't all kinds of people. We were all together wandering, wandering. And sometimes we'd stay at a place for, you know, days and days and months and months. And then sometimes we'd pick up and have to leave right away. This is indicative of our greatness. It's indicative of the greatness of that generation. And since we are the spiritual descendants of that generation, we can connect to that. So what does the wandering represent to us? So in some ways, the wandering represents to us, actually, that's in my notes. Okay. In, in some ways, the wandering represents to us our ability to trust in Hashem, and pick up and change direction as needed, okay? Six months ago, it looked like this incredible peace was breaking out in the Middle East. By the way, seeds of that are still there. And people were so hopeful, first of all, when finally, finally, the embassy was transferred to Yerushalayim as it should be. We're not going to talk about the state of Israel and get too much into that. But I mean, you know, if you're going to represent the Jewish people, Yerushalayim is our capital. It's our eternal capital. Okay. It's a capital of our people. So much anti-Semitism anti that had really plagued us in this country. A lot of people don't know about it, but I live in Borough Park, Brooklyn. And I can tell you all these attacks that have been going on the past several days. Okay, I don't know if you read the more religious newspapers, you'll see what's been going on the, a, a block away from me just yesterday. Okay, just, just really craziness. This was going on very much so from about 2008, nine through 2014, 15. Okay, there would be spurts of it, but it wasn't in the media. Now, because it's really, I think, just so crazy and there's so many people involved, I don't think the, I don't know if the mainstream media is reporting on it or how much they are, to be honest, I don't have, I don't look at that stuff, but I, I, I'm assuming that it's more in the media since a lot of people are speaking to me about it, okay, more in the mainstream media. So this stuff going on is another clue to us to connect with this idea of wandering, this idea of traveling, this idea of this isn't our permanent place, wherever that may be. And by the way, I think maybe, I don't know if she's here today, but somebody from Eretz Yisrael is supposed to be here today. And even in Israel, 
you, we're still in a state of galus, galut, exile. Okay, you have to remember that wherever we are, as long as Mashiach hasn't arrived and everything is in the, the whole era of Mashiach, we're in exile. And this wandering, the, there's so many lessons in these wanderings. Now, the, the Ben Ishkai, by the way, has beautiful, a beautiful parish on each place the Jews camped and the Kabbalistic and mystical meanings of it. If anybody's interested, I don't know if I can get an English copy, but um, I, I was actually thinking of, of working on a translation with someone because it's really fantastic because it's so many clues to the, the messianic era. So by the way, I'm holding up the Mashiach book. Okay, there's the little markers in it. You can ignore those. For everybody who hasn't gotten your copy yet, just send me your mailing address and Hannah or I, probably Hannah, Hannah Snyder, who's here, I know, will send it out to you, okay, for free. All right. Um, and uh, it discusses the times of Mashiach. Okay, it's an introduction, actually. So we have this idea of the generation wandering and their greatness and their obedience to follow Hashem. Cloud of gl glory would, would, um, come down or would lift up and they would just keep on following okay now uh this generation your miyahu says was praised by hashem he called this generation his bride going after them in the wilderness which is very touching and very beautiful okay and that's because they followed him now we're going to get to the complainers and the erev rav a little later on but know that overall there was a greatness in this generation, especially since they didn't know when they would get to Israel. They didn't know. Okay. Can you imagine just wandering for years and years and years? The lesson is, again, wherever we are, we're still wandering. No matter what our environment is, we're really not settled. Okay, there's a famous commentary in the Talmud. Uh, 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 some some rabbis are traveling by ship and they finally spot land and they go and they camp on the little island and they make a barbecue okay i don't think they use the word barbecue in the talmud but you know what i mean they put out some a fire and they they roast their hot dogs and whatever and they start to eat and the fire gets warmer and warmer and all of a sudden this island starts shaking and shaking and shaking this terrible earth earthquake and throws them into the sea now because their boat was happened to be very nearby they were able to swim there and survive so what is this what is the uh, the nimshah what is the, the the moral of this story so the moral of this story is is that for a jew Wherever we are in the world, as soon as things heat up, the world throws us off. It turned out, by the way, that that island I forgot to mention was a giant fish. Okay, sorry about that. So the world throws us out. We have seen this over and over and over again. We saw it in Spain. We saw it in Germany. We saw it in... Uh, Iran, we saw it in Iraq, we saw it in France, England, okay? We have to be prepared mentally for this. We have to be prepared mentally. It's a very shocking concept, but we have to understand that nothing's stable and we can't necessarily, and we shouldn't necessarily trust in the stability we see can be overturned at any time. I think for many people, 9-11 was the first big shakeup, okay? COVID was another shakeup. Messages from Hashem, we're going to talk about that in the context of the part show shortly. So there's a note that I want to read you from, I'm actually not going to read you, but I'm going to say that it's from um, Rabbi Hirsch, and it's it's really amazing. He said that the the idea of this wandering and moving and so on, just constantly being in the state of only relying on Hashem, this was our training, okay? These were our ancestors. 
We have their spiritual DNA. This trained us to have a Muna in Hashem, to have a Muna that the Mashiach is going to be revealed, and that no matter what we see in the world, we understand that it's temporary. It's temporary. The anti Semitism, the hatred, the violence, okay, temporary. Okay, it will pass, hopefully with Hashem's kindness and mercy sooner rather than later. Okay. All right. Um, next, I think we're going to go to um, the silver trumpets. It's, um, there's, again, there's so much in this Parsha, so I'm just pulling out points that are particularly interesting to me today, okay? Um, so Moshe was commanded to make two tzotzeros, okay? Those are trumpets out of kesef, out of silver, okay? And these trumpets, okay, I want to um, find you from Rebbe Nachman. Here's some comment on these trumpets. One minute, please. Okay. So actually, it's it's Reb Nuss. He says like this. He explains the reasons, and obviously it's from the Medrash and from Rashi as well. But he elaborates on the reasons why Moshe made these trumpets and why they were sounded. Okay, when they were blown, it was for various reasons. The first reason was to gather the people together. Okay, people in the midbar for announcements. Okay. It's an announcement. Next was to signal study. It's time to learn Torah. Okay. Uh, that has a, a category of its own because it's very precious. Next, it was blown to signal the start. It's time we're moving now. We're getting ready. So the clouds would come, the clouds would lift, the people would pack up, and then Moshe would blow the trumpets, and everybody knew they should start walking. Okay. Next, to call the people to battle, to get their weapons, okay? We'll speak about that another time in another Parsha. Next, to commemorate the Yom Tov offerings, okay? To commemorate offerings. Now, Reb Nussin reveals to us that if we're speaking about the mystical level, what was the sounds of the trumpets? So he says that they were hints to a person to return to Hashem. Like what we spoke about in the beginning about the seven candles of the face, okay? To work on ourselves, to come close to Hashem, to think about Hashem, to sanctify ourselves. We're all capable of it. It seems unbelievable, but we are, okay? This idea that it's a gentle hint, kind of a noisy hint, but still a gentle hint. It's not painful to return to Hashem. And he says that each blow of the trumpet contained a different message. And our souls, the souls of the great generation, that great generation who had tremendous emunah, tremendous betachon, tremendous faith and trust in Hashem, they pack up at a moment's notice, they understood, their souls understood what these trumpet sounds were. Okay, it's a wake up call. Rabbi Nachman also says it's a wake up call to remember Olam Haba, the world to come. The world to come is the next world up there. And the world to come also is the world. It's also a name for the world when Mashiach is here. Okay. So this idea is that these trumpets gave us hints and each person would hear them in their own way. Again, speaking to our individuality and our own individual path and own individual mission as we make up the Jewish people as a whole. Again, envision that chain. So you hear a hint, you see a hint in what's going on in the world. You see a hint, I really need to bump up my, my tzedakah giving. Another person sees a hint, you know, I really, I have good connections. I really need to start 
you know, contacting my connections to make sure policies change, whatever it may be. Okay, another person sees it, I need to pray more. I'm not concentrating on my prayer. I'm not able to concentrate. I want to improve. Okay, whatever it is, it's different for each person. These are hints to us. Okay, the trumpets are the, the pleasanter hints. What's going on in the world is often not such a pleasant hint. Okay, um, now I want to say, um, Rambam says something interesting. Let me find it. A minute here. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Okay. So I want to. It, I really would like to read what Rambam says in a translation completely. Okay, so we can all pay attention to this. This is important. And I, um, okay, when you go to wage war in your land, so I mentioned to you, okay, this is his comment on that. I mentioned to you that, that the trumpets were also used to call people to arms, okay, call to fight. So the Torah commands that the trumpets be sounded to arouse the congregation whenever the land is struck by distress, whether it is war, epidemic, or drought. The blasts of the trumpet are a call to tshuva and a reminder that the distress, and I'm going to use my own words here, are when we move away from Hashem, when we transgress. Okay? That's what every distress that we see, nobody likes this message, by the way, but that's what every message that we see, everything we see in this world, from anti-Semitism to the bombs of Hamas, they should be wiped off the face of the earth, and so on and so forth. <laughs> okay, all of this is a call to us to light our own menorahs. Okay, there's a link there, it's very important. Because for people to interpret such problems as merely coincidental, the Rambam says it's vicious, it's, it's cruel, it's evil. Don't think it's a coincidence. Don't think it's a coincidence about what we see going on. Because we're going to end up, why? We're going to end up attributing it to things other than Hashem. Okay. This will, if we, it's cruel because this will prevent the nation from changing its ways and causing them to continue any practices that cause misfortune to befall them in the first place. This is not a popular message for many people. It's hard to swallow. Okay. It's hard to swallow. But this is really a significant portion of this Torah Parsha. This is really a significant key thing here that Rambam is saying. He's reminding us what the Vilna Gon said, what Rebbe Nachman said, what, what Moshe Rabbeinu said, what, what the Baal Shem Tov said, is that whatever we see going on in the world is a message to us to come back to Hashem. And if we see something positive, great, we should be inspired to come back to Hashem. But if we see something negative, we have to feel an urgency. Now, we think, well, wipe out Hamas, and we'll get rid of all these, we'll make laws that protect us on the streets of Brooklyn and New York and Miami and Chicago and LA, and this will all be taken care of. I walked out, by the way, I walked out the other day, I think it was Sunday evening around five or six o'clock, there were police cars on every single corner with police men and women walking around, questioning people, have you seen this car? Have you seen this person? Are you okay? Have, was your shot, have you been bothered? I mean, it was, I've never seen anything like it since, um, I would say since 2000 and uh, maybe four, five, like I was at, still after in the, in the wake of 9-11. We used to have National Guard on the streets before Yom Tov here in, Bar in Bar Park. So this idea is, is that we attribute all of this stuff that's going on to the monsters out there, okay? The haters. But the truth is, is we have to look in the mirror and improve. It's from Hashem. 
How can Hashem send such terrible things? It's a basic question. If you know this answer, okay, it's in review for you. If it's new to you, how does Hashem send us such suffering, such difficulties? Because the tzaddikim say, we don't necessarily pay attention when he sends us rainbows and puppies, okay? This is not Hashem's preferred message to us. However, everybody from the Lubavitcher Rebbe to, um, to uh, I don't think Rebbe Nachman actually said it, maybe Rav Levi Yitzchak said it, to every tzaddik, basically the Chafetz Chaim for short, anti-Semitism, as awful as it is, is a gift to us. It reminds us that we're different. It reminds us that we're Jews. Okay, now, does this mean we shouldn't fight it or we shouldn't protect ourselves? No, of course not. We should do everything in our power to keep every life safe. Absolutely not a question. However, we also have to, at the same time, remember that our main hishtadlis, our main actions to take, our main efforts to take must be in coming closer to Hashem from wherever we're at. Whatever, remember I spoke about that chain at the beginning, you may be on chain 47, someone else is on chain 63, someone else is on chain number 1000, someone's on chain two, it doesn't matter wherever you're at. Your mission is to push yourself a little bit up the chain, just a little bit, okay? It may mean, you know, I mentioned before, just like holding your tongue once without saying something critical of someone, okay? I keep mentioning it because it's obviously something I've I've worked on it. I'm always working on it. Okay. You know, but also to think your thoughts, you, you can't take any other action, change your thoughts, work on them, work on thinking positively about your, your fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. Okay. Learn a little Torah. Think about, put a little Torah in your mind. Okay. And this is considered vital, as vital as someone going out, getting a gun, God forbidden, you know, guarding, guarding people. Everything we do is a potential to bring safety to us because a gun and a, and a, and a um, proclamation and a, and a law or a bill seem very important. We get confused and think that that's the main thing that's taking away the gazera, the decree. It's not. The main thing taking away the decree is when we come closer to Hashem, when we do tshuva, when we remember who we really are, okay? We're really not Americans. And I have news for my friend here, if she's here, we're really not Israelis. We're Jews, okay? We're not New Yorkers. We're not whatever, we're Jews. We are different. And most of our problems with the world come from not remembering that. Now, I want to talk about Yisrael. I want to talk about um, Moshe's father-in-law, who was a convert. And in this Parsha, I probably, yeah, I skipped something. Okay, that's all right. In this Parsha, uh, Moshe begged Yisroel. Yisroel, when they were done with Mount Sinai, he wanted to, Jethro in English, he wanted to go back, go home, okay? Return to wherever he was from. Moshe begged him to stay. And his main reason wasn't that just that Yisroel was a holy convert. He was, he was, uh, he was a Jew like any other Jew. He now had a Jewish, a fully expressed and actualized Jewish soul. Okay, I think his name became Chovev. I think he had a few names, you know, a, a, a beloved, you know, um, a loved one. I think that's what his name became after he converted his Jewish name. So this idea is, is Moshe begged him to stay. Why? Why was he so concerned? He knew Yisroel was certainly going to keep the Torah wherever he was. He knew that Yisroel was now part of the Jewish people. Moshe was concerned, says the Midrash, he was very worried how the rest of the world, the non-Jewish world, was going to perceive Yisroi's leaving. Okay. How were they going to perceive that a convert to Judaism 
who believed in Hashem decided to you know go away, go somewhere else, go live off, off in the wilderness, go live without a Jewish community. He said, no. He said, the rest of the world is going to see that you're not identifying as a Jew, that you, okay, you're Jewish, you believe in Hashem, but not enough to stay connected with the Jewish people. Even, by the way, even though Yisroy didn't have bad intentions, apparently he just wanted to go and, and work his business, and, and I think he wanted to do key roof. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about what he wanted to do. No, Moshe said, no, stay with us. The end result, by the way, is in question. Some uh, It's not really clear in the Parsha. Um, some comments say he stayed. Some say he went. Some say only his son stayed. Whatever the point is, is that this was Moshe's concern. How we look to the non-Jewish world. He didn't say we should be more like them. No, it's good. You should be more like them. No, he said, no, I want you to be more Jewish. Be more Jewish. You're a Jew. Stay with us. Okay. Stay with us. Stay together. Be a part of that chain. By the way, Yisroy had some very holy descendants. Okay. They were real. They were famous for their Torah. So, you know, it, some part of him stayed, whether it was sons or hymns or what other. Some parts stayed together. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, give me one minute. This. Okay, now I want to talk about, I want to get to the man, the Erev Rav, and even a bonus uh, 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 section, if we have time, on Gog and Magog, okay, the war before Mashiach. So, we understand that what was going on at this time was that the Jews had the man, the manna, okay? And everybody is familiar with the man. This isn't new to, news to anyone. If it is news to you, please go online and Google M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, manna, and look it up, okay? The man fell in the desert, and we can look up, we can look up all the laws and the parsh and so on, I don't want to go there. I want to talk about the people that weren't satisfied with it. So the man was a perfect food. It perfectly nourished the person. And depending on one's level of connection to Hashem and awareness, one tasted what they wanted to in the man. So all the flavors were there. Okay. You just had to turn it on, so to speak, spiritually. Okay, so very spiritually advanced people, it would just taste like bliss to them. And then next down, it might taste like a steak or whatever, if you're a vegetarian, whatever, I don't know, something else, okay, miso soup, and so on. So all the flavors were there. And the man also was so nutritious that the people, as long as they were eating it, which is obviously many years, didn't have to excrete, okay? They didn't have to go to the bathroom because there was no waste matter in it. It was a perfect food from Hashem. And I encourage you to, you know, hopefully you're reviewing the Parsha each week. If you're going to shul, you're, you're hearing it and you're reading it while it's being laned. And if you're at home, you know, pick up a, a, a chumash and, and read the Parsha. Okay, it's fascinating. So anyway, some people weren't crazy about the month. They were the complainers. Who were these complainers? These complainers were the Erev Rav. Who were the Erev Rav? So on a very simple level, they were the people who attached themselves to the Jews when they left Egypt. And they were Egyptians. And they were converts. And next week, by the way, we're going to talk a lot more about the Erev Rav because it's more featured in the Parsha. But for now, we have to understand that they are part of the Jewish people on one hand. And on the other hand, they cause us a lot of grief. Okay. The Erev Rav were not such sincere converts. Okay. They saw the benefits, they wanted the benefits of being a Jew, but they didn't particularly enjoy all the sacrifices that went along with it. Okay. So 
what happened is, is they began to complain. First of all, they were the people who wanted meat in the desert. Okay, if everybody remembers that there were complainers who wanted meat, and then Hashem sent the spav, the, the, the quail down until the people were sick of meat. They, they, they over, over gorged on meat, and some of them died. Okay, but these were the people who started the complaints. Why? Because they were the most connected to their physical cravings. Okay. They didn't have the wherewithal to get to the point where their cravings were mostly spiritual. It was food, food, food. And the Medrash tells us really what they were craving was immoral relations. Why? because previously people could marry much closer relatives. And then at Mount Sinai, when we got the commandments, when we got the whole Torah, we learned that people can't marry so closely to different relatives and they can't marry you know, two sisters at the same time and all this stuff. And they didn't like it. They wanted really the cravings that were being expressed for meat and their rejection of man was really the cravings for immorality. And we know from what Rebbe Nachman tells us that there are three taivas, three cravings that are closely linked. They go hand in hand very often and they feed off each other. Money, immoral acts, or too much of that act of, of, of the sexual act and food, okay? And at different points in life, people struggle with different ones of these cravings. The cravings themselves are the issue, okay? We need money. We need to procreate. We need to show love. And we need to eat. There's nothing wrong with the acts themselves, okay, as long as they're done in a holy manner. Nothing wrong with, you know, we need money. We have to live and we have to give tzedakah. We need to have children. We need to feel close to our spouses. We need to show that love. We um, receive that love and we also need to eat. We have to, we have to say brachas on our food. We have to stay alive. Okay. So these people were very bound up in these cravings. And this is what sort of threw the spanner into the works for all the Jewish people because they started it. It says in the Medrash that even the Sanhedrin, who were the tzaddikim, the, the, the 72 appointed um, elders, okay? They were the tzaddikim. They also actually felt when they heard people complaining, they started to feel a craving for meat. These were totally spiritual people, okay? This lesson is for us, simple one. There's many of them, but a simple one of Peshat is don't hang around with people who are gonna bring you down. By the way, it doesn't mean you should shun another Jew or another person or whatever, but don't let them influence you. Don't spend vast amounts of time listening to their nonsense. It will bring you down. You, it will bring you down. You know, Rebbe Nachman has lessons about this and Reb Nussan has prayers about this. Be careful of who influences you. Make sure you're looking to the tzaddikim to influence you. Okay. So, uh, you know, the Medrash on this is so interesting. There's so much in here. Um, one more thing. I do, I do want to say one more thing. The other, the other test of this Erev Rav here, okay, and there's, there's so many layers to this, is that they were provoking people with their craving for meat to not, to weaken their betachon, their trust in Hashem. They were making people ask, how could Hashem provide meat in the wilderness? Now, what was so crazy? If you saw the previous class with my little graph that I did, you saw it at all four corners of the camp of all the tribes were cattle, goats, sheep, cows, whatever. This was meat, there was meat. The people were eating man, but there was meat, mainly for offerings, but it was still there. 
and they were questioning whether Hashem could give them meat in the desert? Doesn't make sense. That's the power of the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav says everything's about what you see and what you want and what you desire. That's reality. Okay. Hashem, oh, he's up there. He can't send us meat. Of course, we know what happened. He threw down millions of quail on the people until they were sick of it. So who is the Erev Rav? So next week, we're going into more detail about it. But the Erev Rav are people, even today, who take us. Uh, Manuch, I see you have a hand up. I'm going to, is, is you, you have a question in one minute are people who today take us away from what? Okay, from our jobs? No. From our homes? Not necessarily. May, although in some cases in Israel, yes. These are the people that take us away from our attachment to Hashem, His Torah, and the Jewish people. Now, they may be um, politicians. As a matter of fact, there's, um, there's quite a few prophecies, basically, that they are politicians. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. Um, the Jewish politicians. Remember, they're part of the Jewish people, the Erev Rav. We have to keep that in mind, that mixed multitude. Okay, I'm not talking about non-Jewish politicians here. They may also be, according to Rebbe Nachman, who speaks about false leaders. This is his term. Okay. Leaders who aren't really connected to Torah and they're leading the Jewish people astray. These are people who don't believe in the Torah as the word of Hashem and the Torah specifics, the specifics of the Torah as valid. They're in their mind. It's either valid for some people and not others, or valid today or not valid today. They're also the people who, eat, whether they believe or not, are arrogant. Arrogance is perhaps the most defining characteristic of the Erev Rav. They're arrogant. They really believe that they're in charge, not Hashem. Okay. It's quite an amazing commentary on this. Well, that's the Vilna Gon on that, by the way, in, in, in brief. There's so much on this, but the idea is that they're still part of us. So how do we view them? So the first thing is, is we need to stay away from them and to recognize them for who they are, but it's very difficult. I'm not going to say, by the way, right now, I'm going to give you some opinions of Rabbanim next week about who they are, but the idea is it's very difficult. And the other thing that we also have to keep in mind, which is even more mind boggling is that the era of Rav, many of them are actually capable of tshuva. They're actually capable of changing their status. We see it. We see people who scoffed at Torah and scoffed at Hashem and changed their status. They became true believers and they work for the good of the Jewish people. So, we want to understand that they're the people who incite us against Hashem, and they are the people who are actually responsible. They're the seed for what I said before, sending all this distress to us. They're the ones who have rejected Hashem. They're causing the most distress for us. It doesn't mean that we don't need to improve as well. We absolutely do. But what we have to understand is that it's a source of problems for us when we know that there are people who are trusting in government or weapons or anything except trusting in Hashem. It actually hurts the Jewish people. Sounds crazy, but it's true. Okay. Menucha, you had a question. Yeah, I don't know if you want to put this off till next week or not, because it's, it's a little bit lengthy. I don't, I don't have the exact text in front of me, but there is a Zohar that says, I don't know if you're familiar about Asaf tears and Yaakov's tears and this yearning and this change from yeah. physical to spiritual cravings is really the rectification of that we need. 
this year that we need to yearn in a spiritual way, not a physical way. But then I also learned, and I, I don't want to mention names because I don't have the text in front of me, that the Arab, first of all, is the Arab Rav also the Jews who stood by and watched the Egel but did nothing about it? Okay, so that's a really good question. The source that I know says they're the, the ones who prompted the whole Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf, everybody. Um, were they the ones who stood by? I don't know. But if you have a, a text on it, I'd love to see it. So that's why I'm asking you this text that, that I'm that I learned from, and it all, it said that the souls who are in the world now in this age of Geula are actually the Jewish, the Jews who were there that did not stop it. And we are doing the rectification. In other words, we, this is our tough gig now is to crave that spiritual closeness to Hashem and and fix the mess of the physical cravings and that we were in so i don't know the source i'd love to see the source what you're saying sounds reasonable it does and, yeah. um yeah. certainly and the idea is is that we should all be um I'm going to ask you to, um, I'm going to ask you, can you minimize yourself or no? Am I, can everybody see me? I don't think you can. No, it's okay. It's just because this is going to be a recording. So, um, so for, first of all, thank you for that. Please, please be in touch with me because I'd love to see these sources. The idea is, is, you know, I, I want to elaborate on what you said. It's really important. So sometimes we feel this burden that we have this weight on our shoulder that we're making up for the past and, and we're correcting Adam Harishon's sin and Hava's sin and so-and-so sin and that one's sin and this one's sin and da, 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 da. It's like, it weighs a lot, okay? And yes, there is a spiritual level where we are rectifying everything, but Hashem knows that I'm a little it itsy bitsy puny hierifka and i really have to mainly focus on improving myself that's all one tiny step from where i'm at today if i could be just one tiny step better tomorrow or next week because sometimes that step takes months whatever it is so you know i find that i don't find that i find that interesting and fascinating but I find it heavy. It, it's just a personal response. And I think everybody should look in the mirror and work on themselves. And along the way, we are not only rectifying all these you know, terrible things, but we're also lifting up our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, so on and so forth, our extended families, Nishama. I prefer to look at it in the chain part, I like to look up rather than picking up, you know, we talked about the chain in the beginning at the bottom, but I would love to see that source because it's really interesting. So thank you for that great comment. Okay, um, we were gonna get to Gog and Magog. Um, we're running a little bit late. Um, I, I might just keep going, let's see. I, I, this is kind of interesting and I just wanna briefly touch on it. Um, and, and, you know, I do want to say also, I want to jump in here and say one more thing is that I don't want the part, this to become like a class about current events in the Parsha. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. And it, when it's relevant, cert, I mean, it's always relevant, but when it's, you know, when we're all interested in it, like we feel it's pressing. Okay, great. But at the same time, at the same time, as long as the message that's getting through is, is that this is our own personal work that we have to do, you know, whatever is going on in the world, we can, you know, we can find all these fascinating explanations for it and predictions, and there's great books out there and this tremendous shiurim. But if this inspires you to improve yourself, awesome. If this inspires you to feel closer to Hashem, closer to the Jewish people, closer to his Torah, closer to the truth, Sadiqim, excellent. Then you're on the right path. 
so okay so um i do want to speak really briefly i really wanted to get this in today about eldad and my dad they were uh, out of the people that um moshe selected to draw lots um for the position of being the leader um the elder rather um there were two sadikim who didn't appear they concealed themselves because they were so mod modest and they're little mentioned we never hear about them so i i really wanted to briefly touch on them they were prophets and they said like this i want to share their prophecies according to the gemara um eldad predicted that moisha would pass away from this world and yehoshua would succeed him and that Yehoshua will bring the Jews to the land and take possession of Israel. And we know that's what happened. So he was a prophet. And Medad prophesied, soon the Slav, the quails, are going to be brought in. We know they came in from a wind from the sea. They'll cover the entire camp of the Jewish people, and they'll become a trap for B'nai Yisrael. The abundance is going to be a trap. Okay, I think that's interesting. Next, they both said at the end of days, okay, Gog and Magog, okay, and their armies will battle against Jerusalem and fall into Mashiach's hand. For now, this is what really struck me in their prophecy. During this war of Gog and Magog, depending, we don't know what the war will look like. If you want the copy of the Mashiach book, I discuss various potentials there. You're welcome to get a free copy. You could just email me, text me, WhatsApp me. We'll send you a copy. Okay. Um, but for seven years, they say in their prophecy, B'nai Israel will not need fuel because they're going to get sufficient fuel from their enemy's weapons. Okay. There's more, but I just wanted to keep that in mind. And I'll tell you why I wanted to keep that in mind. Because I think about the gas prices and the energy prices that are rising. They've been dramatically going up. And every single thing is being affected. Because why? Because everything is transported using some kind of energy. Okay. So I went out the other day and I got some vegetables, a little tiny, I mean, it wasn't a lot, and it was $60. And normally, on the normal world, I wouldn't have paid $40 for it either, but where I live, it would have been $40. This isn't a matter of a week. How did that happen? Energy prices are going up. We know that the Torah predicts that when prices get out of control, especially for basic food stuffs like food, they say wheat, but Wheat often covers all food. We know this is a sign that Mashiach is on the way. But what's so interesting here, it says that for seven years, we won't need fuel. Somehow, maybe through a technology, through some very supernatural event of Hashem, we will be getting all our fuel. We'll be using the fuel from our enemy's weapons. We can think about that also as a metaphor. If you would like, you're welcome to, because it's a beautiful one. Anyway, that's it for today. Oh, I see I have some questions. Oh, Manuka had to leave, wonderful. Um, oh, question from Charlene. It's actually a good one. I'm gonna answer quickly. Why did Mich Charlene, always, everybody asks a good question, but Charlene asked very good questions. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu allow the Erev Rav into the Jewish people when Hashem didn't want them? And are they also big rabbis? So very quickly, you know, there are a few commentaries on this. In short, M Moshe believed that they were, you know, they had Jewish souls. And that if they were around the influence of all the Jewish people in the wilderness who we've been talking about, what a great generation they were, they were tzaddikim, okay, that the influence would wear off on them and they'd do tshuva. And Okay, it's possible. We don't know every detail, but it's possible that some of them did turn around. And that goes back to what I said before. Even the Erev Rav, even the people that look like the absolute most potential worst enemies of the Jewish people who are Jews, we all have our, in our minds who that may be, okay, could do tshuva. You know, Rebbe Nachman used to sit and play chess with all 
the um, members of the Haskalah, the Maskilim, the people who wanted to throw, who had thrown off the Torah, they didn't, you know, they just wanted to live like non-Jews. They didn't want to be bothered. Okay. And worse than that, they wanted to convert everyone else to their way. And unfortunately, they were very successful. But Rebbe Nachman used to play chess with him. And when he passed away, and everybody couldn't understand, why would he be bothering with these people? You know, I, why would he waste his time? They really were enemies. And when they passed, when he passed away, the leader of the group, I, I don't remember his name was Moshe or something, whatever, said to Reb Nussin, he said, you think you miss the Rebbe? He said, if the Rebbe was around a little bit longer, I would have come back to Hashem. I would have come back to Torah. Okay. So we understand that Moshe Rabbeinu could see the Nakuda Tova even in the era of Rav, even in the era of Rav, there was a potential for them to really come closer to Hashem. Okay, so I wish you all a, a wonderful week. I want to thank um, Dr. Eleonora Gaudis again for sponsoring this class and, and for the previous classes. And uh, may it be um, a source of merit and bracha and blessing for her and her family. I want to thank everyone for coming and I hope you all have a wonderful week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for helping out, Charlene. Thanks, everyone.